We are live. So, sir. yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Rakesh Rajput, uh, President of AOPAS. Uh, I really welcome you uh, to this um, um, webinar, which is basically not only an AOPAS webinar, but also a webinar for YROC Global, um, which will be uh, telecasted to you slightly later. And uh, uh, the AOPAS Association is an association of the Association of uh, the Pelvic and Establer Surgeons uh, of India. And uh, I think it just took on 2005. And from there, I think many uh, doctors have joined and it's gone from strength to strength. And uh, really now anybody who does uh, pelvic establer trauma in fair amounts in all over the country is a member of this organization. So anybody who's uh, still waiting and who does fair numbers, I would expect them to join us in near future. The joining bit, I think you can talk to either me uh, later after this webinar or even later, or Dr. Abhay Lenz or Secretary Dr. Pranav Shah. Uh, I'll request now Dr. Pranav Shah to come and introduce the actual course. Pranav? Yes, thank you very much. I take this opportunity to first of all uh, thank uh, Dr. Pradeep Nemade and his colleague Dr. Sandeep who have helped in coordinating and getting everyone together. I thank uh, Dr. Rakesh Rathput who is so academically inclined and he always pushes everybody to do more and more webinars. I'll take this opportunity also to thank uh, the uh, Viroc Global people who have given EOPAS the opportunity to send this to our recording, which should be useful to people who would want to, you know, uh, pursue a career with pelvis tabular surgeries. Uh, the course is divided in three segments. First segment is going to take care of case-based pelvis uh, injuries. Second would be a case-based acetabulum injuries. And third would be special situations which we are faced with in and out in pelvis acetabular trauma. So without wasting any further time, I invite our past president, Dr. Pradeep Kothadia, and another senior executive committee member, Dr. Samir Agrawal, to take uh, charge and uh, invite uh, the speakers for pelvic session. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce our faculties who is going to give, have a case-based studies. The first speaker is Dr. Vivek Trika. He is from Ames, Delhi. He is a professor of orthopedics. He is very well known everywhere for his work on his pelvivascular injuries. <laughs> the next case is going to be presented by Dr. Ginesh Kare, who is the head of the Department of Orthopedics in Medical College, Belgaum. He is very much known for his uh, minimal invasive uh, surgery in uh, uh, pelvivascular in injuries. The next case is going to be introduced by Dr. Raju. He is from Hyderabad. He is working since in hospital in Hyderabad. So we have got three faculties who are going to uh, give us enlightened some pelvic injuries which are a little bit uncommon, but they are going to make the things simple for we people. Now I request Dr. Vivek Trika to just share his case of pubic diastasis with a sacral dysplasia. Okay, so good evening, everybody, and thank you, AOPAS, as well as Viroc Global, for giving us this opportunity to be discussing the cases on pelvis. This is a case of APC injury, which is slightly different from the routine ones. I'll just present the case, and then we maybe we will have the discussions which we can have later. He's a 32 year old male who was hit by a vehicle had some abdominal injuries as well, which were treated conservatively and had pain in pelvis. And this you can see is the MLC X-ray, which is normally got. So this was the X-ray, which we had got. And as per the protocol, once the patient was revived and was resuscitated as per ATLS, then the pelvis X-rays were got uh, done. So these are his pelvis X-rays. And you can see and if we just look at them and try to find out what exactly is there, we can see that there is some symphysal disruption as well as a left SI joint dislocation, which we can see by the opening of the SI joint on one side and the symphysis, which has opened up anteriorly, which is around about two centimeters to 2.5 centimeters. We all know if we are going to have the pelvis uh, fractures or so, we will get the CT scans done. So this is what the CT scans were done for. 
And this is the standard thing which we could get from the 2D and the 3D scans. If you look at it, all the scans, the, both the coronal as well as the axial scans are showing you the SI joint disruption. And the anterior SI joint symphysis also can be seen in the three-dimensional CT scan VRT images. So if we have to make a diagnosis of a pelvis injury, this will come into most likely, I think, APC2 or 3 injury based on the wide displacement of the SI joint, both in the axial section as well as the coronal, which appears to be both in the anterior SI joint ligaments as well as the posterior sacroiliac ligaments. What is the management? Management usually will be a symphysial disruption. So we do a symphysial plate and based on our preferences, we can put in a iliosacral screw or transsacral transiliac screws or a usual anterior SI joint plating, which are the most common of the methodologies, which we are options, which we use for an APC2 or a three engine. So if I can say, if it was so simple, it wouldn't have been here. So what is different here? So if we can see, this is the index case outlet view, which I'm showing here. This is another case of a pelvis fracture. And this is another case of a pelvis injury. But if you see the sacrum in all the three, you can see the sacrum is slightly recessed in the pelvis in the normal one. Here you can see that the L5 and the sacral ala have got a transitional sort of union. And if we see here, there is some oblique association between the, or you can say lumbralization of the sacrum or the sacralization of the lumbar vertebra. So these ones are the normal, this one I, I would say is a transitional fracture or vertebra, whereas the index case which we are discussing is having sacral dysmorphism. So if we look properly at the outlet view, these are the classifications or the characteristics of a sacral dysplasia, which is an upper segment sacral dysplasia, which is that the sacrum appears to be higher than the ilium. The mammillary bodies, which are there in the lumbar vertebra can also be seen, which is seen on the right upper corner of the arrow. The sacral foramina, which we see of the S1 are oval in an outlet view rather than roundish, which we all want that it should be a perfect circle. We can also see a residual disc space between the S1 and S2. And if we look carefully at the SI joint and the sacral ala, we can see that the angle of the sacral alas are acute alar slope is there. So these are the characteristics which we should always look for in a sacral. Dysmorphism, and this is a paper by Chip Rout and Sam Morshed where they have said that these are the characteristic features which we can see in the sacral dysmorphism. Is it so common in India? Yes, this is our own paper in JCOT where we found that yes, there is sacral dysmorphism in India. And in one of the subsequent papers, there were 300 pelvises and we found roughly 60% had some sort of sacral dysmorphism. I'll just like you to have a look into this CT scan. It shows where exactly all the views are here. And if you can see, concentrate on the lower sagittal section and you can see the two red and blue lines which show where exactly our entry point for the iliosacral screw is and which is the angulation which we are looking. I'm looking at perfectly sacral views. I've angulated it. And you can see what is in the coronal section as well as in the, in the axial sections, which, which we can see that the angle and the ailer slope is quite different. The slopes are different. In a normal... CT scan, if we look, these are the ways where we can put in the screws, but this is the index case, which is dysmorphic. So if you need to put in the screw in the S1, you have to be very cautious, not like the regular one. And if you look at the coronal image as well, if you're putting in a screw, you have to be very accurate to be going above the foramina and below the sacral ala. However, if you look the S2 vertebra and that space between that, that is hugely prominent. And that's what is all of it about. So this is the 3D scan of our index case. These are the Ehlers slopes and you can see the neural foramina is very high. 
as well as you can see that the S2 corridor is very big of our eggshell scans. So what we did, it was a supine. We took it fixed X-ray, fixed symphysis first, like the standard ones. We had the symphysial fixation done with three screws on the either side, and we had an accurate reduction of the anterior symphysis. And we had planned for an iliosacral screw fixation, which we planned that we will be putting it for the S1 in an oblique fashion. The posterior fixation, you can see we have taken the ICDs and below that I'm taking it very low on the lower level and the lower posterior quadrant of our rectangle. And if we look at the outlet view, the direction is an acute ailer slope is taken into account in the outlet view out here. And subsequently the screw has been put, which needs to compress it. Once we have put that, then we go in for the S2 corridor, where the S2 foramina and the vestibule or the corridor is huge and wide, which we had seen on the CT scans. And then the screw as a neutralizing and a compression is put in the S2, which gives us a transsacral or a transiliac long screw, which gives us a good reduction and a good stable fixation of the posterior side in this. This is the long transsacral screw at S2, and this is the interior screw, which you can see in S1, with a lateral view showing that our screw of the S1 has to go at an oblique angle to the ailer promontory. This is the post-op image, both iliac outlet and the normal images. And you can see that as we go, the stability of that fixation has been good. And we have been able to get and maintain that fixation for three months and 12 months when he has been able to do all his activities. So I'll just finish off this case presentation by saying that sacral dysmorphism is a thing which may be required to be looked at. It's a common entity. You require the CT, which we say has to be a must for all the cases. This is why the CT is important because your iliosacral screw might go in a wrong direction and cause neurovascular damages if you do not see the sacral dysplasias. As I said, there are wide implications for surgical management. And if you need for this, remember that if you look for sacral dysmorphism, you will have a narrow and angulated ailer slope of S1, but a very wide corridor of S2 where you can put in these screws. I thank you for your hearing and for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Trika, uh, for a nice presentation because we are also encountering near about 25% of cases have sectoral dysplasia and we have to take care. Uh, next presentation, uh, I invite Dr. Dinesh Kale. He will be talking about lateral compression injuries, the most common injuries in pelvic fractures. Uh, Dr. Dinesh. Yes. Hello. Yeah, I'll be talking about lateral compression injury. Now in the pelvic injuries, this is one of the least morbid injuries that a patient can have. Lateral compression injuries generally occur when the pelvis is subjected to injury from the side and the pelvis tends to turn inward. The force may be directed directly applied over the iliac crest or over the GT. If it is over the GT, then it leads to an establular fracture also along with the uh, lateral compression injury. If the pelvis is subject to pure lateral compression injury and with no shearing forces, the posterior structures are usually not injured. But it's very rare to have a pure lateral compression injury. I have a case which is pure lateral compression injury. The anterior lesions due to a lateral compression injury may be on the ipsilateral side and or the contralateral side of the side of the posterior injury. Here you can have all the four rami fracture, but they are fairly undisplaced. Posterior injuries may be in the sacrum from just the anterior sacral fracture to a complete fracture of the sacrum. Now, LC1 are relatively stable. You have an oblique fracture of the pubic rami and ipsilateral anterior compression fracture of the sacral ala. LC2 has a rotational unstable element, vertically stable. There's a posterior fracture with dislocation of the ipsilateral uh, iliac. That means you get a crescent fracture 
and type 3 is an unstable fracture where you have a ipsilateral lateral compression with contralateral apc also involved now this is a case where you can see both the injuries are there on the side on this side you have a crescent fracture on this side you have a si opening and bilateral rema but these rema are fairly well placed plus you have a vertical fracture going from through the foramen so it is not moving forward now very clear cut you can see here that this part of the sacroiliac joint has opened up and this is the crescent fracture that you can see here so in short the fractures noted are left sided crescent fracture left sided si subluxation right sided si subluxation bilateral transforaminal vertical fractures and bilateral superior inferior rema fracture what was the approach we did a percutaneous bilateral transacral screw fixation and through a aip approach plating of the anterior ring done spanning across the pubic symphysis these are the intraoperative siam pictures where we have done two sacral uh, screw fixations both of them are trans iliac transsacral fixation and then we went ahead to put a plate now we had to extend this plate from quite high up on the right side to cross the pubic symphysis because the patient had a bilateral superior rema fracture now this is the immediate post op x ray you will find that the uh, sacral screw has been fixed and the plate has crossed this is a 4 months follow up x ray this is her 6 months follow up x ray she is absolutely comfortable walking about at the end of 18 months in between due to covid we could not get her for follow up but this is her final picture that i have got 18 months after the index surgery in short the lateral compression lc1 and lc2 are fairly simple injuries lc1 and sometimes lc2 also can be treated conservatively however lc3 does require surgical intervention thank you thank you dr dinesh kare for थैंक Europass as well as uh, Vira Global for giving me this opportunity. I'll be speaking about uh, a case where we had a vertical shear fracture and uh, of the hemi pelvis with a sacral fracture, and we have done a triangular uh, fixation. So coming to this case, this is a 35-year-old male who had uh, met with a road uh, accident where he is a farmer by occupation and had uh, a topple of a truck. factor uh, in which he was traveling so he sustained injury to the pelvis his chest and a humerus fracture initially he was unstable hemodynamically he was managed uh, uh, with a pelvic binder and uh, traction and chest tube and multiple transfusions in the center initial primary center once he had become stable he was referred and what we found was he was uh, clinically stable and uh, but he had a, a foot drop on his left side so we went ahead and uh, uh, did a ct scan to see how it is and we found that the left hemi pelvis along with the part of the sacrum is totally disrupted and away from the rest of the remaining sacrum and the spine so this is what is called as a spino pelvic dissociation so what uh, if you took a look at the Uh, inlet and outlet view you will appreciate that the left hemi pelvis is uh, prone for 
multi direction in all three direction different uh, forces and it is a very unstable uh, fracture so what was the, our aim of treating this fracture our aim is to restore the alignment between the ilium sacrum and the spine and uh, uh, achieve stability of the hemi pelvis to the spine so how do we uh, uh, so that we uh, have a uh, achieve uh, stability both in translational and rotational uh, stability in both in vertical and horizontal direction what about the neurological and we are, because he has a foot drop we have to think about decompressing uh, the uh, fracture also so we plan for a triangular fixation that what is you mean by triangular fixation you have uh, one component called as a lumbo pelvic fixation where you have uh, uh we counter the vertically uh, the, uh, related uh, forces and then you have the horizontally uh, uh, countering uh, a fixation which is the si screw so uh, if you look at the papers among the different types of fixation the triangular fixation has maximum uh, stability so it gives maximum axial stiffness wherein there is very little movement at the fracture site and helps in union so we plan for it but before we do that what very important you look at in the back uh, the lumbar region uh, to look for any degloving in our patient we didn't have any degloving at the same time the patient has to be stable we also look in detail about the ct scan we have to look at the how the l5 s1 facet is l5 pedicle and l5 transverse process in our case we had a l5 transverse process fracture but the pedicles were intact so we can put a pedicle screw in l5 we also look into the part of sacral disc morphism as dr vivek trika had told because that is how you you will plan for putting your si screw and then uh, we have to uh, look into the intraforaminal bone fragments uh, because that if they are there then we have to do a foraminotomy we operated this case in a prone position uh, we have draped from the whole of the lumbar region up to the natal cleft then took a midline incision from l4 to s3 our incision was there and we subperiosteally elevated the, all the muscle so that uh, the transverse process as well as in the anterior uh, posterior superior leg spine and posterior inferior leg spine are visualized well this is the technique we have used for reduction we give longitudinal traction for vertical displacement then we put it in extension for flexion deformity then we internally rotate for external rotation deformity and lateral displacement is uh, reduced by you know, a weber clamp then we put the pedicle screws both in l5 and s uh, l5 and l4 then the ilial screw and then once we finish that then it is when we put a iliosacral screw this is the once we have done that finally we put the connecting rod between the ilium and the spine this is the sequence of which we have to do we'll talk about the ilial screw but that is the most important point here there's a, a cleft between the posterior superior iliac spine and the posterior inferior iliac spine that should be your entry point you should direct your entry from in a lateral position to the inferior position generally the drill will find its way between the outer and the inner cortex and your length should generally be between 80 to 100 ml uh, 100 mm so that it has a purchase at uh, two segments of the iliac corridor in uh, how do we know whether we have placed it in a correct position you look into the iliac view and you see that it is directed at the anterior inferior iliac spine and it should be above the sciatic notch in an obturator outlet view which should lie within the tear drops in this case this is how these are the uh, pedicle screws this is the ilial screw and it is the connected with a connecting rod we do not do a decompression here we have just achieved a accurate anatomical reduction of the sacral fracture that itself will uh, cause a decompression of the nerve root in a indirect way 
Then post-operative, you can see that these are the post-op X-rays, both in the inlet view and the outlet view. You can see a very good reduction of your uh, sacrum, uh, uh, both in the inlet view and the outlet view. Generally, uh, we ask them to walk partial weight uh, immediately at uh, for the first six weeks. But in this case, we did not allow because he had a humerus fracture. And at end of six weeks, we made him walk full weight bearing. We found that at end of 12 weeks, almost we could see some haziness around the sacrum. And at end of six months, he had almost a near total complete uh, recovery of the foot drop. We also recommended for removal of the lumbosacral, uh, lumbo, uh, lumbopelvic uh, uh, implant removal, but I don't think uh, he, he ever turned back again. These are the post-op pictures. You can see the uh, incision, both the humerus and the uh, spine. He's able to bend very well. And if you look at the video, he has uh, really uh, recovered foot drop with a very little uh, uh, residual uh, part where he's not able to dorsiflex it to the maximum. So in conclusion, yes, uh, sacral fractures um, where there is a spinopelvic uh, dissociation, these are highly unstable fractures and are generally associated with neurological deficit. And management generally involves restoration of the hemipelvis to the spine, and this can be achieved by a triangular fixation. What does the triangular fixation provide? It provides absolute stability. So your fracture union is consistent you can start early weight bearing and secondary complications are generally less. In terms of nerve decompression, whether to decompress or not to decompress is debatable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ashok, for the nice presentation. Now the topic is open for discussion. Any questions from the Dr. Trekha? Yes. Yes. Any questions to Dr. Trika? So, uh, Dr. Trika, what is your preference for posterior fixation in dysplasia? Whether only one screw is sufficient or S2 is sufficient or you have to put both S S1 and S2? Because no, you are fixed depends. at ear. Yeah. No, that's not fixed. It depends upon the sacral dysplasia. Sacral dysplasia has got its own morphology and variety if you can say severity so depending upon if i can see that i have got a good pedicular area next to the neural foramina and the alar slope can allow me a fixation i might go in for a fixation of sacral dysplasia for an si joint dislocation however if it is a sacral fracture and i have a sacral dysmorphism then i'll prefer to put in my screws only in the H2, which is giving me a broad corridor, and in that corridor, I can put in the screw. At that time, I will try to put in that screw as trans sacral transiliac screw, which will be encompassing both the iliums on either side, and is going to give me as good a fixation and stability as the two screws which I'm going to put. Vivek, this is Sunil. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Vivek, like with such a big S2 corridor, why not uh, do both idiosacral and a transsacral screw at S2 instead of S1? Yeah, you can do that. No issues regarding it. I will prefer to put in the S2 screw. It only depends that if it is a fixation which I can get from S1 and I've got an imaging where I can do that, I have done that. Otherwise, all the screws which you usually put in a sacral dysmorphism are going to be in sacral S2, which is going to give you a very big corridor. No doubt about it. Your main screw is going to be the H2 one, which is going to give you the as good fixation as anybody else can give it to you. And a transsacral one, which is going to give you the best. Dr. Trika, in case if you don't feel, uh, if you are not able to put the screws in sacral yes. dysmorphism, what is the alternative, what is the other thing you can do? Yeah, so that's the most important thing, which I would like everyone to note that. The pre-op CT scan is the most important thing. We just don't get the pre-op CT scan to get the diagnosis and confirm the diagnosis. However, we are getting this for making sure that uh, we do not have sacral dysmorphism and planning our options. As I showed it to you, there are various options for the sacroiliac as well as for sacral fractures. And we normally go in for a iliosacral screw, which is the most common response. 
Yeah. However, if there is a sacral dysmorphism, we can ideally go in for an anterior SI joint plating as well. Or if it is not so common and we are not able to get that thing, we might go in for a posterior fixation by a transiliac plating. That is going to help. And in a sacral fracture, if we have sacral dysmorphism, then as Ashok has shown, we can very well go in for a lumbopelvic fixation with a comminuted neural foramina, then it's two sort of a sacral fracture. So we should not forget these options which are also there. And that's why the CP preoperatively is very important in any case of pelvis as well, where we have to look for the sacral dysmorphism, which may not be so visible in a fixed ray until unless you get a very proper outlet and also to look at the corridors which are going to be given in an axial CT or a coronal CT corridor. Can I ask a question, uh, Dr. Samir? Yeah. 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 So my question is to Ashok. Uh, what is your take and your comment between uh, indirect reduction and uh, neurological decompression versus direct open reduction and neurological decompression for zone three and zone two injuries? I think uh, in zone. Uh, Two injuries. I think whenever there is, uh, um, uh, you find a fragment uh, inside uh, uh, the neural foramen or inside, I think that is when you have to uh, best uh, do a decompression by doing a foranotomy. I think that is the thing. What was the other question you asked? I didn't. So what is your take between indirect and direct uh, uh, reduction and decompression? The literature seems to suggest that uh, there is uh, not much difference between an indirect reduction and the decompression that it provides vis-a-vis -vis yeah. an open reduction and a direct decompression of the foramina and the canal. Yeah, I think uh, as long as you don't find a, a fragment, you know that which is not uh, compressing onto the nerve, uh, I think you can leave it and do a, a indirect uh, reduction of your fracture and then uh, you don't have to do any decompression. That itself is a decompression of the nerve. But when you find a fragment in zone two in the foramen, I think, and which is compressing or which you think is going to compress on there, it's better to do a decompression. I personally feel that. And in type, in, in terms of uh, zone three bilateral fractures, and there's a complete uh, displacement of the uh, whole of the sacrum, uh, uh, anterior displacement. Uh, that is when I think uh, dorsal uh, uh, laminotomy of the uh, sacrum would is more theoretical and uh, more uh, sensible in doing that in those cases. Okay, thank you. Hello, Dr. Kitka. Yes. Uh, Dr. Tony. Yeah. Okay. In dysplasia, there is a so many papers that there is a difficulty. They are telling about the CT guided uh, screw fixation. Do you have any experience with the CT guided screw? Uh, personally, I do, not, I do not do it. The CT guided, yes, you can do very well navigated iliosacral fixations, especially for the sacral dysmorphism. You can have you use an OAM or you can use the navigation as well and try to do that. But if you have adequate experience, I think, and you have a good image, the most important thing for putting in an iliosacral screw in fluoroscopy is having a very good image. If you can have a good CAM with good resolution, I don't think it is that difficult to put in an iliosacral screw, even with sacral dysmorphism, as I've shown you. I use a normal CT uh, CAM and do all my fixation. Yes, you can do navigation and further advancements are always positive, I think, if you have a good experience and have passed the learning. Okay. Any sequence in the order of fixation, you would prefer to put S2 first and then S1 or S1 and then S2? Uh, I would say that if it is a sacroiliac dislocation, I feel that if I am getting my oblique screw first, yes. that is the screw which is going to give me a proper shearing, uh, sorry, uh, the compression which I need. The S2 screw, as you saw, is a transsacral screw. So it is just going to be more of a positional or a neutralization plate, as it is called. 
rather than giving me the compression in a particular direction which I want for an SI joint dislocation. So preferably, if possible, and as you could see that this fracture, was, this dislocation was a wide one. So I would prefer to put in an S1 if I am able to put that in a proper way from posterior to anterior and from inferior to proximal and superior. Get the compression in the direction and the angle of my SI joint, and then put the transsacral big screw, which is going to give me the stability as well as acting as a neutralization for me. Dr. Dinesh Kale is in the habit of putting a trans ideal screw. Any problems while putting that screw? It's just a long corridor screw. No, to put a uh, trans ideal trans sacral screw in a dysmorphic S1 is very, very difficult. They don't advise it. It's always just to have a SI screw. Uh, Vivek, uh, coming back to my question again, like uh, you said uh, the S2 screw has to be a uh, transsacral, transiliac screw. Like, do you mean that you can't do an SI screw on in it at S2? I, I didn't get you. Can, can't we do what? Yeah, uh, do you mean that we can't do a iliosacral uh, configuration at S2? Iliosacral fixation at H2, yes, we can definitely get that and we can leave it without putting in a transsacral screw as well. The only thing is that, yes, the fixation might be much more stable as it is going to go through four cortices and giving me a better stability than a, just a screw which is going into three cortices. So that's my only thing. If we can put in a trans, if we can put in a S2 screw which is going up to the opposite side SI joint, it's just a matter of three centimeters more or a two and a half centimeter more. And if we can get the screw to put in the transsacral. The compression which is achieved, if we are not getting it, remember if we are doing it percutaneously, the compression will be achieved more by putting it at an angle and perpendicular to the SI joint, I would say, rather than just at a transsacral. A second addition to what Gavaskar asked was, if there is a vertical shear element in that, then this four quadrant fixation will add to a better fixation than just two SI screws in S1 and S2, I feel. If you are having a vertical, then the Asian loading part, then you have to have, if possible, two screws, one in S1 and S2, which is going to give you a better fixation. That's what I yeah. Okay, I think uh, if there are no questions, we can move on to the next session. And uh, I request Dr. Rakesh Rajput and Dr. Papanchari to take over the session. Is Dr. Papanchari around? Yes, yes, he's there. So, sir, do you want to call in the next speakers? Yes. I think you have muted, Dr. Papanja. No, I think he has not been able to log in. He is trying to log in. No, no, he is logged in. I can see him. Okay. Uh, he just says unmuted. Okay, unmuted now? Yeah. Can you hear yes, me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. We can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we start off with the acetabular session now. The first presenter is uh, Dr. Pranav Shah, who is going to present a case of posterior wall fracture with impaction in vitro reconstruction. Dr. Pranav, all to you. Thank you, sir. Okay, you can, you can start, Pranav. Yes, So, this is a case, it's a single case, a commutated posterior wall fracture and I am presenting a slightly different or uh, you can say unique fixation technique. So this is a 25 year old male with road traffic accident, has a posterior hip fracture dislocation, neurologically is intact. This is his pelvis with both hips AP x-ray 
and I want you to note in this X-ray the hip dislocation, which can be seen in the difference of the arcs of the sorcil and the head, the posterior wall fragment, which can be very well visualized, and the intact anterior vessel as well as posterior columns. So this is the thing that we note on the AP X-ray. Apart from that, we take the obturator and the iliac view, and we can see that both columns are intact. The posterior column is intact in the iliac view, and the anterior column is also intact. Obturator ring is intact in the uh, obturator view. So with this kind of X-ray and with the patient in the emergency room, uh, question to Dr. Uh, Rakesh. So would you want to do a CT scan before reduction or after reduction? And if you want to do it before reduction, would you do the reduction in emergency room or under general anesthesia in your OT? Yeah, so Pranav, it's a very good question. Uh, is it me you asked, is it? Yes. Okay, so I think you are okay as long as you have a very gentle traction in emergency and basically you're just putting it back and if it comes without any grinding sensations, you're allowed to do gentle traction in emergency. But certainly, uh, uh, you know, with some sedation, but otherwise, normally I would advise against trying to reduce uh, with any force uh, on these sort of pictures. Regarding the CT scan and all that, um, I would probably prefer to do a CT scan first before I even do uh, any sort of a reduction on these patients. But gentle reduction in emergency uh, is okay, particularly if you're late in the night, you know, you can't get uh, ahead of anything. So that is okay. But remember my word, gentle reduction. Yes. So the CT scan was done. Uh, reduction was done in anesthesia. This is the reduction uh, X-ray in the OT. Now, before that, let's just have a look at the CT scan. We can see the hip dislocated. We can see a large posterior wall fragment over here. And we can see some comminuted pieces like this. So you can see over here, there are comminuted pieces which we can very well see now on the CT scan. I have highlighted them. So it seems like an articular piece. And as uh, rightly pointed out by Dr. Rajput, any attempt of forceful reduction may even worsen, worsen this combination. These pieces may be get trapped or they may get ground. They may get uh, broken further and it will make the reconstruction very difficult. So the CT scan, CT scan shows that the, uh, the comminuted wall fragment is there. Uh, reduction under anesthesia done with very gentle traction and then thereafter we went ahead for the surgery. So operative findings were there was these two small articular fragments which were lying loose and they were reconstructed using these two K wires. The K wire tips were cut at both the ends so that they don't protrude out. This is the area in the posterior wall where there is a void. So even though the posterior wall will be in contact, inside there is going to be a gap. And this is the piece which actually belonged to that, which was loose lying. It is reconstructed into one piece and then it is put back in its position. Over here, you can see very well that that piece is put back and then the posterior wall was closed and the plate was applied, interfragmentary screw was done. These are the articular images if you can make out. This is a provisional reduction of the posterior wall with K wire. These two small K wires represent that fragment which we have made into one piece. And after that, we are putting this plate which is going to neutralize the forces and also the interfragmentary screw for the posterior wall to get a little bit of compression. And this is the final fixation of that patient. Here is the post-operative X-ray. Now we can make out that the head is well, head is well reduced and the position of the implants is good. This is the iliac view as well as the obturator view. Again, we can confirm the congruence and we can make sure that there is no other loose fragment anywhere else. Now, the important question is that are these wires actually not violating the joint? Because if they are, they can create a lot of problems in form of arthritis or chondrolysis. And how can we, because in our hand, we have put in exactly the right position so that it matches to the congruency of rest of the hip joint. So all this can be assured by doing a post-operative CT scan. So this is the post-operative CT scan. You can see in the 3D view that the wall fragment is back in its position. But more importantly, you have to see the two-dimensional view where you can see that loose fragment over here, which is very well congruently sitting in the hip joint. <clears throat> that same loose fragment over here and over here, which is put back in its position. 
and you can see that the congruency has been restored. So this is the three month follow up that patient, the patient's fracture healed and patient got full movement, painless. The evidence suggests that intraarticular gaps and steps have poor prognosis, especially in posterior wall. So we should put all the efforts that we can to correct it. And this is the three month post-operative obturator iliac view. My message from this case was that intraarticular comminuted fragments needed to be restored to its original position. And when we want to do it, this is one very useful technique. Thank you. Thank you, Pranav, for that excellent presentation. It's a common problem. We see a lot of, uh, first of all, fractures with um, severe combination. And um, it's very encouraging that you could uh, get a good reduction and a good fixation. It, of course, it's a short follow-up, but patient doing very well. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now, we go on to the next presenter. Next presenter is Dr. Adul Patil. This case is a case of transfers with the posterior wall fracture, utility of anterior column screw in lateral position. Dr. Adul, over to you. Good evening. Am I audible now? Yes. Yes. Uh, I must thank Dr. Aopas, President, Secretary, and Viroc Global for giving me this opportunity to present a talk on utility of anterior column screw in lateral position, a case of a transverse with posterior wall fracture. So when you need a posterior approach, you need a posterior approach in uh, when there is an anterior screw is needed, transverse, transverse with posterior wall, T fractures or bicolumn ACPHT. But scope of anterior column reduction via posterior approach is necessarily needed in transverse, transverse with posterior wall and T fractures. And the anterior column screw is can be done in association with uh, Cocker Langenbach approach, totally percutaneous, or sometimes you can do in lateral position some modified iliofemoral a window, and then get the reduction and get the anterior column screw. You have to reduce anterior column before fixing the uh, posterior component, and then by digital palpation, CM, and many special reduction clamps are needed, percutaneous clamps, long clamps. A collinear clamps through the additional window or through the greater sciatic notch, uh, you can reduce the anterior column, quadrilateral plate, and then go ahead to fix the anterior column. So KL approach, same ex exposure is needed or additional percutaneous entry with a long sleeve, uh, which gives you a very good help for an anterior column screw. Sometimes uh, you need a trochanteric clip osteotomy for the same uh, purpose. So you have a, a entry point which is luteinal. This is very important just because we need a long screw coming from posterior to anterior. And it is from the outer side of ileum. It is around three centimeters to four centimeters proximal to the joint. And it is just posterior to the anterior gluteal line. It's a two centimeters area where you can go for uh, anterior column screw. And then there is something called a scale screw, which is a more of transverse fracture. You have to see a greater sciatic notch and the bin point between the ASIS and AIIS, you mark the line and you come to the center point. And from there, you can go ahead to put a KL type of anterior column screw from the posterior approach. So these two entry points are very necessary. And views. So you need a good CM views, fluoroscopic views to see AP, obturator oblique, and iliac obliques are must. But what is more important is combined uh, obturator outlet view for hip penetration, obturator inlet view, combined in iliac inlet view for pubic ramus and combined iliac outlet view. So these views, let's see, this is for obturator and obturator oblique outlet, avoids hip penetration. And it's a good outlet for a, when you use an outlet view, it's a good for a bony uh, uh, path of your anterior column screw. Similarly, obturator inlet view is needed for medial uh, prevention of medial cortex pen, uh, penetration. And you can see the entire ramus so that you are in the bone and not outside the ram ramus. So these are the in iliac inlet views where you, again, uh, you are not going to the hip joint. You are not coming out of the uh, pubic ramus and you are in the bony corridor and that gives you a good anterior column screw. So this is a preoperative case where you can see both columns are involved in the anterior column line is involved, posterior column line is involved. This is the CT scan of the same patient. The head is displaced uh, in, uh, medially. 
this is the two dimensional ct scan these are the some fancy ct scan where the anterior column is broken posterior column is broken then there is the posterior wall is also broken so because of the posterior wall it has decided that we have to go for posterior approach plate and interfragmentary screws and then followed by anterior column screws i have decided to go for a cocker langen back approach but being the uh, head uh, the the fragment which is of the wall fragment which is much more at the superior dome area i decided to uh, do a flip trochanteric flip and these are the intraoperative images you can see this is a combination of kl screw from the posterior approach so uh, first a trochanteric osteotomy done cocker langen back exposure is done then the small plate for the posterior column reduction then a uh, interfragmentary screw for the posterior wall then comes the plate for the posterior wall and in the end it, there are two screws these are the anterior screws so this is one screw which is coming through the plate this is called as kl screw and the second screw which is independent which i have taken a small entry outside the uh, 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 plate uh, through a long sleeve and you can see a such a long sleeve a long uh, uh, screw which is of a 100 mm length and and you can pass that anterior column and it has neutralized one is uh, positional one is compression uh, serving the reduction of anterior column so same is fluoroscopic images obturator outlet view you can see now it's nicely placed inside the two anterior column screws and the lateral view showing that you are completely in the pubic bone and it is slightly bent that indicates that you are in the pubic bone if it is not bent that means that you are not in inside the bone and you are somewhere else so these are the uh, screws which can uh, help you to uh, neutralize the anterior column when there is a transverse element of the fracture and when you are you have to force to do this because of the posterior wall associated with the transverse element so one plate for the uh, one plate for the column one plate for the wall ifs for the posterior wall and the two screws for the anterior column which showing the immediate post operative picture this is a follow up after 2 months and this is the follow up of the patients after 5 months unfortunately this patient has lost his leg because of the amputation crush injury at the same time and this is the same involved limb which i have operated and now even after that now he started using a prosthesis and he is walking but you can see a nicely concentrically reduced the hip joint and healed a trochanteric flip osteotomy a small case where there is a, a transverse with posterior wall where you don't need a long uh, in a uh, screw it is just a example of posterior uh, cocker langen back anterior column screw which is a more of a transverse uh, supra acetabular screw taking care of anterior element and this is one year post op uh, having a good result so when one can use the modification of anterior column screw acceptable anterior reduction if not reduced be ready for another approach and proper reduction is necessary either with column screw or the plate but reduction has to be there before you start the anterior column screw it is mandatory just a separation or a step is uh, a small step is okay but uh, gross un mal reduction is not acceptable you have to reduce it and then go for the screw or the plate with the same uh, incision or the same different incision steps position lateral reduction of posterior and anterior parts cm views important anterior column screw entry point and completion of screw after guide wire and drilling through with the all seeing all views it is important to see in lateral position you have to see all those views which i showed and see that you are in the bone not outside the bone and not in the hip joint not outside the ramus and then go ahead and do it advantages can avoid dual approach reduced morbidity and be careful of anterior vascular structures and on middle side you be beware of the hip joint thank you thank you very much thank you dr patel it was a good demonstration of a difficult and potentially dangerous uh, fixation uh, nicely presented thanks we will go to the next case the presentation by dr pradeep namade a case of acphc anti wall with impaction let's salvage the geriatric acetabulum uh, pradeep over to you thank you uh, so uh, let's discuss uh, the geriatric acetabulum um, i'm going to present a case of uh, anterior wall fracture with a dome impaction 
Okay, so farther backward you see, the further forward you can uh, look ahead. So uh, if you see this 2003 article, uh, you know, genetic acetabular fracture, Dr. Jeffrey Angelin has said that uh, girl sign, that is a dome impaction, is, uh, this patient has inadequate reduction, early fixation failure, and uh, uh, joint narrowing and subluxation. And it was said that it had 100% prediction of failure production. So with that uh, uh, background in 2021, we received one patient. Now this is a, this is a uh, 67 year old male. He was the executive. He was a highly active patient. He had a trivial fall at home and he had a uh, pain in left hip. And now that's the AP XA that we're going to see. As soon as we see this AP XA, we're going to look, uh, notice uh, this gulbing sign. And you know, that's the um, uh, fracture fragment just spreading across like the wings of this seagull. And if you see the CT scan now, it's pretty sure that you know there's an anterior wall kind of a fracture, and there is a, a, a quadrilateral plate that is also fractured here. Uh, we can see that there is a stripe uh, kind of combination here. How, however, the anterior wall uh, that is uh, um, uh, the the iliopectinal line somehow uh, is not broken. You know, it's just ballooning out of the uh, fracture. And if you see the uh, 2D uh, CT scan axial view. Uh, uh, we can see now uh, as as the fracture uh, as the as the cut goes near the acetabulum, uh, we can see that this is the 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 impacted area is rather more posterior than a more common anterior injury that we uh, generally see. So we can see that this is a posterior kind of uh, the uh, impaction injury. So uh, if you see the axial, the uh, coronal images again, we will uh, notice that you know that the area is more of a posterior superior. So that is the superior part of it, and as we go posteriorly, this is the posterior part of it. As we uh, this is the typical posterior superior. As we go take the coronal cuts more posterior, we can even see that stellate kind of the uh, uh, still out in the posterior column there. You know, if we we have seen in the three D CT scan. The posterior column was intact, but from inside it was seen to be fractured. And now, when we see these uh, head subtracted images, and now it is pretty clear that though the CT was showing the anterior injury was more, we have a very big chunk of the cartilage of the posterior column that is also taking part of the fracture. And it is almost fracture near the margin, almost one centimeter medial to the uh, peripheral margin of the posterior column. And that's how it correlates with the uh, that stellate sign that we saw in the CT scan. And now going back to the iliac view, we are not seeing the iliac view in the uh, in the beginning, but now I want to show the iliac view here. And we can see that the uh, the, the posterior column uh, outline, that is the lesser sciatic notch and greater sciatic notch is intact. But look at this, what is happening? The head is going more and more towards it. That means definitely there is a large amount of subchondral infection that can occurring in the posterior superior area. And whenever in an anterior wall fracture, you see a iliac view that is showing you picture like this we must suspect that is a posterior superior impaction rather than the anteromedial impaction. So if you see these uh, typical uh, force vectors of the anterior column, uh, we have these three vectors and uh, we would expect that the, in the injury would be more anterior, but sometimes we do get this posterior impaction and the answer lies in the bone quality. So if you have subchondral bone quality that is very uh, weak, then as the head goes down, it just breaks that subchondral area and just crushes that bone and then the head moves forward and impacting that area by the way it is going. So we have different kind of impaction pattern generally. This is non-impact factor. This is the anti-impaction. Sometimes we can have a post-impaction in the same anti-wall fragment or sometimes we can have a double impaction injuries like this. And if you see this uh, fracture, we have a kind of post-impaction as well as uh, a small bit of anti-impaction in this. So this is a typical fracture in osteoporotic bone, low energy elderly patient outside cortical injury is less, and typically the either anterior wall or ACPST fracture. And the treatment for this has two simple principles. One, that we need to anatomically restore the, um, uh, the articular surface. For that, we need to do lateralization of the hip, localize the area of impaction, and elevate uh, in a proper image guidance. And we need to have robust support for that uh, reduction. So the approach is the anterior intrapelvic approach. We need to open the fracture site by either lamina spader or with the long artery forceps. And that's how it has been done. We have uh, just opened the anterior uh, uh, the fracture, and then that's how we have localized the dome impacted area there. So this is the, that's the area where there is the dome impaction. 
and uh, then comes the imaging so now uh, uh, there are uh, this is a dilemma what view we are going to take because this is a posterior superior area as opposed to the normal anterior area so normally if we have to focus on the anterior superior area we will take a obturator outlet view like that but if we have to focus on the posterior superior area we need to take obturator inlet view and this is been clarified in this diagram if you see obturator outlet view like this it is going to focus more on this area so anterior superior area however for focusing on the posterior superior area here we need to take this kind of a obturator inlet view like that also called as a roll over view and that's what is was taken during the surgery so this is the typical ap view and this is what is the obturator inlet view and we can now nicely delineate the uh, impacted area there we lateralize the hip by putting a shank spin there so that is the shank spin we have lateralized the hip and then we have put reduce the anterior column put a uh, anterior column plate so that has made the ant working anterior column and now we have seen this impact area nicely isolated there so that area was elevated with a curved elevator we put a structural graph in a v shape manner there we just fixed that graph there and then we close uh, the lead by using the uh, ball pointed pusher and then fix it temporarily with the k wire like that and then we put uh, our uh, infrapectineal plate to close the uh, peripheral buttress and now comes the job of putting a subcondyle screw so the first subcondyle screw is going from this area top down from here so this is a representation image of how the supra intrapectineal plate will go so this screw goes uh, just subcondyle from superior to inferior and then the another screw that goes from medial to lateral in a little bit posterior orientation like that and that all the things are done in obturator inlet view and then we need to take a view a little bit adjust the view and make sure that your reduction is good and the entire implant are outside the joint so the joint is free of any interarticular hardware and then uh we uh, fix the anterior uh, plate as well and then uh, that's how is the final fixation done i have added one small third plate also to just buttress whatever the area of the anterior column that was there like that a small third plate and that was the posterior uh, that was the post of reduction and now we can see that the hip is very well lateralized we had a slight slight superior lateral head damage because of the medial migration and just like a, a hill sack lesion uh, of the shoulder like that and this is around 4 uh, to 5 months of post op the hip is well lateralized and this patient is uh, walking so it's one year post op now i just uh, called him to give me a video unfortunately we couldn't get his walking video but he's uh, back uh, to his whatever he is uh, doing and is uh, absolutely pain free right now so take home message is that uh, for success we need to have proper understanding of pathoanatomy we need to follow the proper principles of articular impaction injury that is elevation subcondyle support and peripheral buttress we need to have robust understanding of nitigities of intraoperative imaging when we will take you which view and uh, which view will be used to uh, see the reduction which will you see to uh, have the hardware like that and we are one step closer in hip salvage in elderly uh, however isaac newton said that what we know is a drop and what we don't know is the ocean so we need to keep on uh, looking into the depths of uh, this particular injury thank you very much thank you for pradeep for that excellent uh, presentation as we know uh, geriatric acetabular fractures uh, make me more and more common and we are going to see these cases more often now we go to the last paper in this session uh, presentation by dr sujit tripathi a case of transverse fracture ali fmr approach is man of the man This is about transverse fracture management through the ilo femoral approach, and uh, I would like to mention about this particular approach because a uh, few years back we are operating all our transverse fractures which are anterior displaced through the ilo femoral approach, and I didn't find any mention of this particular approach in the AO surgery reference uh, recently that I went through all the website and everything, but I didn't find the mention of this particular approach for the management of transverse fracture. so conflict of disclosure nothing to disclose particularly for this presentation uh before going in detail about the ilo femoral approach let me talk something about the transverse fracture dura and lateral classified this particular injury into the elementary fracture type although it involves both the column because of the single fracture line it was included in the elementary fracture type and just see the sub classification of these particular fractures it is called as transrectal when it involves the roof of the acetabulum when it the fracture line passes between the acetabular fossa and the roof it is called as juxta tectal and when the fracture line passes to the fossa of the acetabular it is called as infra tectal and this is the common term that we use trans tectal juxta tectal or infra tectal for the transverse fracture just see this image you can 
clearly see that the transcriptive axis where the femoral head or hip joint is in the direction of ischio pubic segment so it is medially displaced and in the other side the juxta tactile and infra tactile you can see that the femoral head weight bearing dome is in line with the external dome so if you see overall the prognosis of all these three factors probably the outcome will be very good in case of juxta tactile infra tactile compared to the transcriptal because here the joint line congruence is not maintained and that's the concept of the rubric as proposed by marta and when the roof arc angle is Sujit, you are not audible. Uh, the, are you unmuted? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Am I audible now? You are audible, but you need to uh, speak closer to the in the mic because okay. your voice is very muffled. Yeah. So these are some of the indications okay. of the surgery. So you can see that when there is any intraarticular loose bony fragments, there is loss of congruity. or if the fracture is displaced probably one has to go for the surgery and when to go for the anterior approach particularly when there is anterior opening is present just see this particular image you can see that all acetabular transverse fracture can be accessed anteriorly through the different approaches like the ilofemoral approach iloinguinal approach and modified stopa approach and see the territory of all these approaches if you realize then the approach is very limited in case of with the modified stopa because it gives us to the gives access to the internal pelvic area particularly the quadrilateral plate and the iliopectomial eminence whereas through the ilofemoral approach whole of the pelvic brim including the inner part of the pelvis and iliopectomial eminence can be accessed and if someone will give the middle window of ilioinguinal incision that the fenestral incision one can access whole of the approach like that of ilioinguinal through the ilofemoral approach So this is a case of 32 year male who sustained a high velocity road traffic accident and one can see that this particular fracture the opening is mainly on the anterior side that means the fracture is mainly displaced anteriorly that is anterior opening so it is a transverse transtractal fracture and the ct scan also clearly reveals that there is opening on the anterior side and this is how we went for the ilofemoral approach the incision was given along the iliac crest and then it was extended below the anterior superior iliac spine about 10 cm below that then osteotomy of the anterior superior iliac uh, spine was done around 2 cm length and 1 cm depth and whole of the muscles the sartorius inguinal ligament was retracted medially the hip joint was uh, flexed and internally rotated and adducted to have more exposure in the iliopectomial eminence and this is how it provides the access into the pelvic brim so whole of the pelvic brim can be accessed up to the iliopectomial eminence so this is how the true pelvis can be accessed through this particular approach and one can elevate the iliopectomial fascia from the iliopectomial eminence to expose whole of the pelvic brim and for subsequent fixations with a periosteum elevator one can detach the iliopectomial eminence also after incising it with a knife and this is how it was temporarily fixed with k wires the reduction was held by the ball spike and then fixed temporarily with the k wires and then subsequently it was fixed with definite screws with 3.5 mm cantilevered screws or 4 mm cantilevered uh, screws by uh, the help of the image intensifier so these are all the intraoperative pictures that can that we can clearly reveal that the positions of the reduction was pretty good and the fracture fixation was nice and this is the intraoperative photograph one can see that we fixed the posterior column through the same iliofemoral approach by putting a screw uh, just 1 cm lateral to the pelvic brim and 2 cm anterior to the sacroiliac joint and two anterior column screws were fixed as per our technique that is the in out in technique that we published a few years back in 2013 and this is the one year follow up of that particular patient so this is how we have modified the approach also that the iliofemoral approach can give access to the that means you can access whole of the pelvis and the iliopectomial eminence uh, up to the pelvic brim and you can put a suprapectomial plate and infrapectomial plate by combining a, a middle window of iliofemoral approach so i would say the iliofemoral approach is a versatile anterior approach and it is the man of the match the reason is if you use it alone you can access up to the iliopectomial eminence but if you combine the medial window of iliofemoral then whole of the pelvic brim can be fixed with this approach and one can open the hip capsule to access the hip joint to deimpact the bone fragments to remove the loose bodies and if needed the outer part of the ilium can also be fixed if deemed necessary 
and you can go on the posterior side to fix the sacro iliac joint also so there was few articles that, that has mentioned that probably you cannot go for a plate fixation through the iliofemoral approach but here in, in this case you can see that we have gone for the plate fixation but remember that don't put the screw in the dangerous zone that is between the antero inferior iliac spine and the iliopectomial eminence you can easily access through the iliofemoral approach alone about 1 to 2 cm medial to the iliopectomial eminence also so if you are putting a plate you can put one or two screws just medial to the iliopectomial eminence and this is what the in out in technique that we published in 2013 in uh, international orthopedics that to avoid image intensifier problem to avoid a prolonged surgery we put the screw from the antero inferior iliac spine just below and lateral to that and it came out of the bone from the iliac wing in the middle part of the dangerous zone and again penetrated the bone exactly at the iliopectomial eminence to purchase in the suprapubic ramus and this is one of the that means uh, case that we used this particular in out in technique through the iliofemoral approach along with a plate and this is what the post op picture of one of the patients where the interfaculty compression was achieved to using in out in technique and this is the four years follow up of that particular case <laughs> this is the transtractal transverse fractures with femur fractures so here also we did the same thing the anterior column and posterior column fixation was done through the iliofemoral approach and this is the five years follow up the patient is doing well the hip joint is congruent and there is no evidence of any degeneration then this is the extension of this particular approach where one can go to the sacro iliac joint for the fixations and this uh, sacro iliac joint dislocation was also fixed along with a recon plate in this particular patients along with the uh, that is the juxtatectal fractures of the transverse fractures so this is the four years follow up of that particular patient and he is doing well so take home message that i would say the uh, this approach should not be removed from the article in fact it is a very useful approach for the transverse fracture management and if you combine with all different types of the medial window of id inguinal or Uh, that is a posterior extension you can uh, fix from the sacro iliac joint up to the symphysis pubis thank you thank you sajit for highlighting the usefulness of aliofemoral approach i am also a fan of this approach with this we come to the conclusion of the established session uh, dr rajput could you take over now for the discussion part yeah i think we have had wonderful uh, presentations so we probably need to uh, you know ask you a few couple of questions uh, just to clear so the first presentation was pranav shah uh, pranav you showed that you fixed the two fragments uh, and you cut the wire at the boundary how were you so sure that that ends actually were together and not something else did you put them back in the fracture site and first found that this is how it's going to be or were you so sure outside itself so the two fragments were of course uh, they were otherwise part of the articular fragment so they have to connect with each other as well and then they connect inside and uh, usually what happens is when a fragment is broken into two pieces usually it is a long fragment which breaks into two so i aligned those two in the long axis it was matching the jigsaw puzzle was perfectly fitting well uh, you can even see the very small serrations of the uh, articular cartilage fitting perfectly well and then uh, we are sure that this is the actual alignment of the fragment with each other and then we put the one screw we don't penetrate the cortex on the opposite side just withdraw it a little bit cut through the tip plier uh, and then push it in and same thing we do with the second k wire we should have two k wires to hold this fragment to prevent uh, rotational uh, instability and then we put it back in the position anyway anybody has a question for pranav pranav yeah. what is the what is the size of the k wires number 1 Number two, one mm. Uh, the number two, the case which you have shown, the uh, articular fissures was not from the weight bearing portion. I think so. They are from the middle portion, not from yes. the weight bearing portion. Yes. So whether it's really when it is not in the weight bearing portion, still it needs to be. Uh, you need uh, those pieces inside for congruity, or you need it in the weight bearing portion. So the combined. Uh... Uh, dimension of these two pieces was 2.5 cm multiplied by 1.5 cm so that would have been the gap if i would not have put those fragments back in its position and if you have seen the post operative ct scan they were in thickness they were more than 2/3 of the entire posterior column in that area so i think it was justified putting them back in its position also i think dr kothari if uh, sometimes uh, even if they are not in actually weight bearing it helps you to put the wall back later on uh, on uh, after you 
disimpacted these fragments. That's that okay. gives you a template for the wall to come back and place nicely. So that there also it helps. So I think we'll ask the question to Atul. Atul, in your presentations, the sequence you said uh, to you know reduce and hold the uh, posterior side, then go and fix the anterior column. But the way you did it, you had actually already fixed the posterior part, not just the reduce and uh, bring them in reduction, but actually fix it. And then you went fixing the anterior column. But the whole reason yeah. for that is because if you fix uh, and compress the posterior column, the anterior may open up and then it may not reduce when you come back to do the anterior columns too. So the way you said at the take home message at the end and what you did was two different things. Can you explain this one? So the sequence of fixation will be the same. Posterior wall, column, wall, uh, column fixation, posterior wall fixation, and the anterior column fixation. But the reduction was done before all together. So temporarily holding the posterior column and at the same time passing the uh, uncoiled clamp from the greater sciatic notch and transfixation of anterior column and then uh, putting the posterior column, posterior wall plate and anterior columns too. Atul, I think next time we will show how you are, CRM, you, you are using CRM in different positions, in lateral positions. That, that yeah. yeah. We, you have told what what uh, uh, images you used to take, take. but yes. uh, the positions of the CM on table, how it yeah, looks. Yeah, and it is very right. Uh, Lee said by uh, Dr. Rakesh that if you don't reduce it beforehand, then you jack up posteriorly, tighten yeah. it posteriorly, and anteriorly and do so you much. don't do, you cannot do anything. So you have to reduce everything together and start fixing from posterior to anterior. It is the sequence is like this. So, any more questions to Vatul? Otherwise, we'll move to Pradeep. Yes, sir. So, Pradeep, in your presentation, uh, when you were doing the reduction uh, for the uh, the dome impaction, mm -hmm. you first fixed the anterior column with the plate and then did the disimpaction for the dome. Is yes. that always your sequence, or in some cases you would? Disimpact first and then put the plate on. Yeah, so um, certain cases we need to main, make a working anterior column. So you need to see that, you know, which part of the acetabulum is going to uh, sit anatomically. If it is, number one, if it is sitting anatomically, it is not going to hamper the reduction of my dome impacted fragment. Then yes, I will fix that fragment first and then reduce the uh, dome impacted fragment. Sometimes the anatomy of the dome impacted fragment is three-dimensional, wherein if we reduce the uh, the column first, then there is no way by which you know you can just elevate it and put it in back place. In those cases, we have to first elevate impact, uh, elevate the impaction, put some bone graft, and then fix the entire column like that. In this case, I found that you know if I just press down the ballooning part, it is going to make my job more easier so as to the impacted fragment will not dance on the concave convexity of the femoral head. So that's why I fixed the anterior column first and make it a made it as a working anterior column. Sometimes we have to impact. Sometimes we may have to take off the plate even after doing the uh, uh, fixation. So that all things we need to titrate inside. So I think that's the take home message from your presentation yeah. that there are uh, various things you have to do. Sometimes the dose impact and disimpaction has to come first. And sometimes you may have to fix the anterior column first and then do disimpaction. So both techniques are uh, useful and uh, available and uh, the surgeon has to decide which one comes first. So, any other questions for Pradeep? You can't let him go away, just with one question. Yes. Yeah. So, I think that was very good presentation, Pradeep. And whenever I uh, hear you talking about uh, it's always very fun. How did you manage to get that seagull on? <laughs> So that, that's the topic for another uh, webinar. Another webinar, okay. okay fine. So we'll do some more uh, graphic uh, lessons later on, how to get the seagull on the seagull sign. Okay, I think the next one was Sujit uh, Tripathi. So Sujit, um, till about a few years ago, I think nobody would have agreed with you uh, that the one of the anterior approaches is the way to go for transverse fracture. Because we know that majority of opening up is on the Backside and 90 percent, I would say, uh, to as far as 90 percent of them open up on the back, and the approach to go would be posterior, and then you put an anterior column, so just like the way uh, Atul was describing. But I think now we have coming slowly to uh, an area where we agree that uh, perhaps there's another way to uh, skin this cat. And uh, you've been doing this for a very long time. 
So maybe we should have listened to you and Dr. Sain much earlier uh, that there is this way available. But uh, doing it from the iliofemoral, calling it as the man of the match, I think was a bit far-fetched because I would say the people who are doing AIP and opening up rattle window might say this is the man of the match. So how would you counter that out? So definitely, it is the man of the match for its territory. Basically, for any fracture, if you say in the entry column, there is the entry part of the transverse fracture uh, limited to the lateral to the iliopectinal eminence. Probably this approach alone is sufficient. But if something medial to the iliopectinal eminence, then definitely I would think it is better to go for the modified stopa approach, or you can combine the financial incision along with the iliofemoral approach to have better access. So within its territory, it is the boss. So let me ask the other guys, uh, what do you think? Iliofemoral with a fanless tail is a better player or a stopper with a lateral window or combined with an iliofemoral is a better player? So it's a team which wins. Yeah. It's yeah. A so team. Which, which, which team? So can we have a raise of hand which team wins? <laughs> so actually, if once you do the ostotomy of the anterior superior ilex spine, it actually provides very good access between the anterior inferior ilex spine and iliopectinal eminence. And that is the main key area that I think. Even you can go for the plate fixations if needed, if it is a comminuted fracture. And if it is a simple fracture, then you can easily go for the screw. Rakesh, uh, people like me want. who will do most of the job from the iliofemoral yeah. approach. Okay. Most of the job from the iliofemoral approach and some amount of work from a uh, stopa approach. Exactly opposite, uh, Pradeep. He no, does no, no. <laughs> <laughs> as the fracture calls, like both column, yeah, no, yeah. both column, like you are iliofemoral approach is really a man no of use. Transverse fracture, no, in fact, I would low both column, low both column, low both, both column. column, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Uh, transverse fracture, uh, but ACPST, you have to go, uh, go for stopa, both column and transverse. But, but I have a question why the EOS reference if you see the website it has not mentioned anything about the iliofemoral approach for the transfer structure it will come yeah i think uh, we, we 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 will for i have one fact, question uh, in fact sujit uh, the current way which ao is moving is actually doing through aip the transfer structure even fixing the posterior column from yeah. the aip approach AIP. so that's another another cat another way of skinning a cat now which is a very new yes. way of doing it i was actually looking for evidence the other day couldn't find very strong evidence for that yet because I think you require special instruments if you want to do this properly. Uh, I've seen people doing it with uh, conventional instruments, even with normal stiff screwdrivers and uh, drills. But I think that might require maybe flexible screwdrivers and flexible drills later on uh, dedicated to this. Even okay. the asymmetric clamp that has been uh, designed, that is for ILO, uh, ILO in one approach. We do right. uh, tend to use it for ILO femoral approach, but yeah. we really need to have a longer asymmetric clamp. Longer, than yes, yes. Traditional, true. Uh, to longer and a much wider uh, area around yeah. it. So, you yeah. have, I have a question to you. When you combine the ilio femoral with the finance steel and passing a plate, aren't you worried about the um, corona mortis? We are not seeing it. Always, always. Blindly. Uh, you obviously. Meet the vessel there. I get that. You like it? So, it? Is, yeah. is that is that a question for Sujit or uh, Atul, the yeah. femoral guys? Yeah. Question. Are you worried worried about corona mortis? You always like it when you pass it from there. Okay. So you see it through the fan steel, is it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So for all practical purposes, what you are doing in fan and steel is just yes. a stopa. Yeah. It is a stopa. Limited stopa. stopa. Yeah. That is limited stopa. Yeah. How, how do you limit it now? It's basically you are going to cut the rectus sheath, you are going to retract it, you are going to erase it from the pubis. And then only thing is that you are not going to go very posteriorly up to the SI joint. But practically what you are doing is what you are doing by stopa. So whether you use stopa with lateral window or whether you use iliofemoral with uh, uh, ferrin steel, you are practically dealing in the same area, the same way, just a few centimeters longer on either side. I, yes. I totally agree with Dr. Pranav. Actually, it is the stopa only. That means it is not a separate type of uh, approach on the medial side. It is the stopa only. But on the lateral side, the only advantage of iliofemoral compared to the lateral window of iliofemoral is that you are doing the osteotomize of the ASIS is there. So your exposure is a little better on the near the iliopectinal eminence. That's the only advantage of iliofemoral. I agree. That. I think, Sujit, the iliofemoral doesn't take time, actually. You know, if you're getting used to it, it's actually a very quick approach and probably gives you better exposure than a lateral window itself. Yeah. Uh, there's no doubt. I think most pelvic surgeons and establishments will agree that uh, it gives you a better exposure 
then a lateral window combined with the stopa i think so, we had a good, good discussion but uh, time time is time uh, yes i think we'll move on I, to the one, one more question that is i have got a question for sujay yes cp yeah so sujay when you plated the the plate the medial screws where did you put uh, the medial screws on the plate it yeah. goes on to superior pubic ramus yeah it, it is in the superior pubic ramus just okay. like medial to the iliopectineal eminence okay it's have you uh, have you had any experience with putting unicortical screws into the uh, anterior wall because if you cannot go beyond that i mean yeah. especially in late cases do you have any experience with putting some screws mm -hmm. in the anterior wall only unicortical one yes sir that we have right. published also in the injury journal actually yeah, communicate that's what i want to do i have read that article yes yeah so yeah, we have to on unicortical screw yeah. right okay thank you nice presentation thank you very much uh, i think we will the next session now. i think we'll call the next uh, chair persons dr gavaskar and dr tony uh and yeah. they'll be like conducting the special situation session sure. dr tony and dr sunil uh right uh, i i'm here i i'm actually like out of power so i'm sitting in the dark here on my hotspot so i'm sorry if you're not able to see me so yeah uh, fine like uh, i i'm not sure that dr tony is there so if he's not yes, i'll just get it going uh, tony is okay? here Tony is here. Yes, I am here. Uh, Doctor, if you are here, please take over. I'm uh, because like I'm not. I don't think I'm visible. Okay. Wow. Well, I think in the next. This one one nostalgium. Then second is uh, pelvis. It is over. No. No. Spa spatial no, no. situation. We have we have a third we have a third third session of uh, spatial situations. Yeah. That is more more unlevelly. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 We have three case presentations there. But I, I, the what you Pradeep sent to me, it is not there. That's why I'm yeah. <laughs> searching for that. Okay, okay Ashok, do you want to call in the next speaker, Ashok? Yeah, 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 yeah. I can call over. Yeah. Okay. So let's get on with the third session. Yeah. Like we have three interesting case presentations here. So let me call upon Dr. Abhay Elens to start with the uh, with his case. Abhay. Abhay, are you here? Dr. Abhay has sent his presentation to me. So what we will do is we will go on to the next session. If by the time he doesn't come, I will play his presentation. So okay. we will go on to the second okay. case. Okay. I think it's da Dr. Das? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Over to you, sir. Okay. Thank you. I think um, speakers like Pranab Saha and uh, Pradeep Nemar have sabotaged my case, actually. So they have... <laughs> They have spoken everything that they wanted to speak about this uh, topic, but only thing uh, different is that I am speaking on a late presentation. One second, please. Okay, before I start uh, talking on this post impact injury, it has already been uh, explained very nicely by Pradeep uh, Nemare and uh, Pranab Shah. Pradeep Nemare gave a MIS presentation. Pranasa gave an open plus he showed some tricks. I'll be doing a total open uh, description. This is basically a delayed presentation of a posterior impaction with posterior wall fracture, which was missed. This was missed because this patient uh, had a trivial fall and complained about some groin pain went to one of his relation who is a GP, who took an x-ray, you know, like the first x-ray you saw when Dr. Vivek Rika showed the pelvis x-ray, that was not very clear, but subsequent x-rays were very good. Like the first x-ray when you have in a &E, you may not get a very clear picture and you should not ignore the patient's complaint and send him home. That's what this GP did. He actually um, saw the x-ray, didn't find much, sent him home. The patient was complaining of pain in the groin, especially on red bearing. <laughs> patient continued to hop around and started giving uh, complaints like giving away the hip. Uh, he was, uh, he had a couple of falls also. Then he came back to the GP that was about three weeks after the injury. So he had a CT and the patient was referred to me with the CT scan. I do not have the X-ray because the X-ray has gone into, it's a medical legal situation. I just wanted to make everybody aware that do not neglect 
if you don't see the proper x-ray you ask for a fresh good x-ray rather than sending the patient home especially when you are busy in your opd this is what the ct scan looked like <clears throat> excuse me this is already 23 days old this is a posterior wall impaction injury in a young person and uh, this is not very clear but you can see that this is uh, sort of bloating up in the back and probably there is a undisplaced posterior column fracture in the 3d this is all pictures i have got so the diagnosis is a posterior wall fracture with undisplaced post probably one undisplaced posterior column fracture already 3 weeks plus so impaction and osteoporotic i suspect because he had a very trivial fall and especially this impaction injury as seen in osteoporotic patient as you have seen in previous presentations so the plan was to because he is a young person plan was to try and do a reconstruction and we wanted to do it through the cocker lengen back approach with trochanteric osteotomy you see this is an intra picture you see this is an incongruity this actually the head is subluxed backwards in the posterior aspect and you can see that the incongruity starts here and there is a fragmented articular piece here you cannot like pranav's case you cannot take them out and fix it because they are already porotic hyperemic and they are already attached to the subcondral bone what i will show you a video clip of what exactly we did this is where the hip was subluxating and it was uh, axial traction was given the uh, cavity was irrigated then the impacted fragments along with the subcondral bone were elevated en mass and using the head of the femur as a template for the whole length of the impaction it was quite a big impaction actually and then from the trochanteric osteotomy site we had to remove the bone graft like cakes and pack them into the void that has been created after elevating the um uh, impacted uh, fragments so these were taken as cakes and bone spreader was used to hold it distracted and the bone grafts were packed into the place and the head of the femur of course used as a template and you cannot fix any implant here like pranav shah showed putting some lost cavities you cannot put anything here you just have to rely on your st the stability by the impaction of the grafts so again after that you have to punch and get the stability by packing the area with the bone grafts and i'll show you that this, this is a big chunk of lateral wall the posterior wall which was there so it has to be put back into its original place after uh, the checking that the uh, hip is congruous and it was fixed with a locking plate i'll show you one more thing this was so porotic you can see in the x ray we have put two screws to fix the trochanteric osteotomy but it was not strong enough we had to put another two to work as tension band to support the the trochanter from getting displaced later on preventing uh, uh, the whole thing getting displaced it was very soft this is the uh, obturator uh, oblique view and this is the iliac oblique view this is the post op and we did a ct scan to check this is what it looked like there are small voids and uh, this patient uh, came back to me after two years and uh, i asked him uh, whether he feels any pain or any uh, instability he was actually jogging long distance and uh, he has started uh, he just demonstrated me how he finds himself absolutely pain free and uh, stable so subsequently he had some other injury he came to me the six years after the in initial injury this is what the extra look like but when i looked at the operator oblique view i found there was some uh, diminution in the joint space i am showing you this enlarged view this is where the joint space is diminished so i asked for a further uh, ct scan and you can see that the space is diminished here but he has no symptoms this was done through this approach and uh, this gentleman has absolutely no problem he is totally asymptomatic the final outcome clinically has a full recovery no deficit on examination either but radiologically he has evidence of early osteoarthritis if you uh, classify according to marta's uh, grading it will be uh, good uh, because there is already a joint space narrowing in the area of repair so take home message adequate assessment of initial injury is essential to avoid late presentations 
reconstruction despite delay could be rewarding. N mass elevation of impacted zone helps to avoid cartilage fragmentation in leopard seed. Once it is impacted and it has remained in the place for a long time, like three weeks is pretty long for an impacted fracture, you really need, don't have to lift it uh, individually, the fragmented uh, cartilage. You have to elevate them en masse and use the head of the femur and mold it onto the head of the femur. The impaction bone blocks grafting avoids collapse after reconstruction because your stability totally depends on how well you have impacted and the quality of the bone. Thank you very much. Are you seeing the? Are you getting the sound for this? Uh, I think we were getting it, but it's a bit muffled. So this is thirty-eight years. No, we're not getting the sound. Okay. And open wounds involving the right forearm, the right thigh, and the right leg, and also develop a moral level lesion. This patient had an open segmental fracture of right femur, had pelvic injuries, which was an APC2 injury, had an open fracture of the both bones of the right leg, mm -hmm. an open fracture of the both bones of the right forearm. This basically caused the open injuries, resulted in the management paradigm being shifted from early total care to damage control orthopedics which meant that the important essentials of treatment, which is soft tissue management, takes priority and the saving of the life and the limb takes priority over order of stabilization and the type of internal fixation that one would use in a given situation. So the management of the moral level lesion, the management of the open long bone injuries took priority over the bony components and then we undertook the treatment of the pelvic injury and definitive management of the long bone injuries. So on day zero, this patient underwent a debridement, an aggressive debridement and stabilization of the bony injuries with an external fixator, both on the femur as well as on the tip and application of a WAC. Following this, repeated debridements were performed and the plastic surgeons performed a reconstruction with a flap cover uh, on day four, around the three weeks, this patient underwent internal fixation for his pelvic injury and the injury to the both bones of the forearm. And by the end of a month, which is about day 35, this patient had a well healed flap and underwent removal of the fixator and intramedullary nailing for the femur. Around day 60, which is two months, the patient also underwent removal of the fixator for the tibia and intramedullary nailing with bone grafting for the fracture of the tibia. So in short, this patient had his injury paradigm shift from uh, early total care to damage control because of the moral level lesion and the open injuries to the long bones of the leg and the forearm and subsequently underwent management of the pelvic injury and definitive management for long bone injury. Now, what is moral level lesion? It is internal soft to degloving because of a high energy trauma, which causes a tangential shearing force where the internal injury is much more than what is visible on the external aspect of the skin. Normally, a moral level lesion can be present anywhere, but the common sites are the greater trochanter, the thigh, the pelvis, and the knee. But lesions can also be seen in the lumbosacral region the abdomen, the calf and the lower leg, and the head. The true incidence of a moral level lesion is not clear or not clearly defined because there is a variability in the detection of these lesions because about one third of these patients who have moral level lesions undergo a diagnostic delay which can vary from a few days to even a couple of months. Coming to the mechanism, basically what happens is an abrupt separation of the dermis from the underlying fascia as a step one, which is followed by accumulation of lymph 
blood, fat, and debris in the potential space that is created. The evolution and expansion of the lesion leads to resorption of the blood, but lymph continues to collect in this dead space. And the secondary sustained inflammatory process leads to formation of a fibrous capsule. And that is a diagrammatic representation of an ML leak. There are certain secondary risk factors involved, which are the female gender and an obesity of more than 25 to 30. But what is most important to understand as clinicians is that to avoid any diagnostic delays, which can be very, very important and which have a very important bearing on the eventual outcome of patients with moral level lesions. So whenever one has presence of tire marks, presence of ecchymosis, friction burns, or contusions over the skin, and especially if these are associated with swelling and fluctuation, beware you are dealing with internal degloving, and beware that you have to dynamically monitor these lesions to, to ensure a good sustained decision-making and a very good outcome. So how do you image these lesions? X-rays and CT scans essentially uh, identify the bony injuries and ultrasound are operator dependent, but relatively inexpensive and readily available investigations, which provide a clue and a definitive diagnosis. MRI though is the gold standard and a classification has been defined uh, to basically delineate the different types of presentations of a moral lab. The important thing to understand is that the management essentially depends upon the viability of the skin and essentially the amount of aspirate that one can get from the fluctuant swelling inside the skin. And to highlight the types of management, this is a 21-year-old sustained an injury in a road traffic accident, had a left iliac crash fracture with a lower flank uh, and proximal moral left lesion. This patient uh, underwent management of his injury and had a very good follow-up at two years. So the important thing in those patients who undergo a conservative management is that the collection in the potential dead space should not be very significant on ultrasound and MRI to choose a conservative management. Very close and dynamic monitoring of the evolution of the lesion is extremely important. And as, as a surgeon and as a surgical team, one must have a very low threshold for surgical intervention in these lesions. Another patient and another uh, basic thought process of management of the ML lesion, a 27-year-old patient, railway accident, a grade 3C injury with a traumatic amputation of the leg at the distal third of uh, the leg with a moral level lesion in the thigh, underwent evaluation and ATLS management and the management of temporary stabilization of the injuries, and that's the moral lesion. This patient eventually underwent a flap reconstruction and a grassless flap for covering the external iliac vessel and soft tissue and skin grafting for the superficial lesions. So the key again in this case was aggressive repeated debridement and a biological soft tissue cover for the moral level lesion. And this patient went to good healing. Another patient, a very different presentation, a 30-year-old lady had a fall from height had a fracture of the acetabulum, had a D12 burst fracture with a paraplegia with bowel bladder involvement. And to make things worse, this patient had a moral level lesion of the left glutei, which was diagnosed on microbiology in a COVID positive patient, which she was as mucormic. So she underwent repeated development of her uh, soft lesion. And this is what she was at the end of uh, the third and the fourth debridement. Eventually, this patient could not be salvaged and she succumbed after the fourth debridement uh, because the moral level lesion did not relent and this patient actually expired. Sclerosin has also been used as therapeutic agents with doxycycline, talc, and absolute alcohol, but these were used in chronic lesions. So, to summarize, moral level lesions are closed internal degloving injuries. One must suspect them if there is swelling and fluctuation. They are associated with high energy trauma. They may present acutely or as chronic lesions and about one third of them may be missed. So a clinical suspicion is very important. The extent of degloving may be more 
than what is apparent on the external injury, contusions, friction burns, abrasions, musk, and MRI is the gold standard for diagnosis. A soft tissue degloving must take priority over the surgical triage. The management paradigm in these situations with open injuries and moral level lesions will shift from early total care to damage control or the medical condition of the patient. And last but not the least, the management options basically vary and depend upon skin viability and aspiration on compression dressings in cases where uh, 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 conservatively managed patients and percutaneous aspirations is also possible where in patients who have a more than 50 ml aspirate, they need a debridement with either a split thickness, a spring graft or a debridement with a flap and minimally invasive to delayed definitive management of skeleton. So thank you. I think Abhay will join for the uh, yeah, yeah, final sir. question answer session. So, uh, do we have uh, Srinivas? Are you ready? Srinivas, you are muted. Yeah. Yeah. I am ready, sir. Okay. Go on. So, good evening, everyone. So, I am to present a case of combined vestibular trauma, a single case. Here is a 19-year-old uh, girl fell from and sustained this particular risk. And uh, so initial uh, where she was presented with a uh, shock and initial resuscitations were done. A fifth day patient was uh, sharing care. And by the time patient uh, is what is normal. And, uh, am I audible? Yeah, now you are, but it is the voice is trailing away. Okay. Okay. So, so for the rest of you, am I uh, shut off your I mean just close your video. Then okay. will be clear. Let me just do. No, it's okay. You can just close. Speak closer to the microphone. Speak closer to the microphone. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So initial resuscitation part was done in some other hospital, and by the time patient presented to me, patient is stable, and then uh, her lactate levels are okay, and hemoglobin is. Uh, good and uh, this is the uh, diagnosis but they have not done anything any external or internal fixation so patient had uh, right sharp femur fracture associated both column fracture with posterior wall and anterior ring injury and right SI joint injury and sciatic nerve injury on that side so all this and with this so, uh, uh, at this point of time, patient was uh, stable. And to start with, I'll take you through the steps. Uh, the initial fixation was uh, in, in a supine position uh, with a bolster underneath the uh, sharp femur fixation was then followed by fixation with anterior pelvic ring and reduction of the anterior pelvic ring and uh, iliac wing fracture from periphery to center uh, for the acetabulum. But for ring restoration, uh, first uh, uh, was the first preference. Then went ahead with posterior uh, iliac wing fixation anterior to posterior screw fixation through uh, iliac uh, window and SA and screw fixation in a supine position and uh, it was a prolonged surgery patient was uh, uh, you know uh, taken out of the theater and uh, took her again after uh, three 
page column and box with yeah academy that sorry yeah so this is the final picture session it was uh, uh, and uh, communicated wall which was uh, where uh, spring plate was used and uh, gt osteotomy was done so and that is uh, the follow up of the same patient after 8 months the fracture soft femur is healing and rest of the fractures are healing and that is the function at 8 months and today i call that girl for her follow up that is her today's uh, mm -hmm. video and uh, i could not get the fresh x rays and to conclude so well, this was the two and a half year follow up the last video the shaft femur fixation especially in combined pelvis tabular fractures uh, takes the priority with distal femur nail which has got an advantage which can be done in supine position you needless to take a lateral position and pelvic ring stabilization is the next priority followed by a stabler reduction that's the message thank you open to questions thank you shrinivas if you can just come out of your uh, presentation yeah um, i think abhay has also joined okay. so uh, faculty any questions for abhay or uh, dr cp das uh, or uh, what my question to dr abhay is what kind of drain that he like do you, do you like like normal such tubular suction drain or a flat drain or a corrugated drain what is the recommendations if you if you are doing just a closed debridement so it depends i mean if it's a less than 50 ml uh, we actually try if that's not very significant uh, fusion or uh, collection in the space then would actually put in a corrugated rubber drain otherwise would put in a suction drain and i have not used it but if i had to i would actually do uh, suction irrigation as well uh, uh, just to clear off uh, uh, the debris which is collecting in the dead space dr helens um, do you ever use uh, this shaver from arthroscopy set for debriding this uh, morella vela or is it uh, helpful sir i have never used a arthroscopic shaver to debride a moral level if i had to go in i would open it up debride and do a frank I mean, I mean in a very sick patient when it doesn't permit to go ahead and do some surgery any anyone who was uh, i mean we have done uh, in a few cases and it's been very helpful uh, putting the arthroscopic shaver because the patient become very sick you cannot uh, even you know giving an because that side is normally you don't get any unless you don't need anesthesia for that because this patient is sick patients and uh, i have found it very useful and only thing um, uh, i don't know whether this is uh, described we have we have used on a few patients and um, most of them have done well actually it, it brings out a lot of uh, debris from inside with through a small incision you put that sever and shave it off That's i how. think cp what it does is gives you a big channel to suck because quite a few sometimes you have big clots we actually don't come out with either a small vacuum suction or with a corrugated drain also so the suction uh, is got a much larger bore uh, and that may help you to actually take it out um, and that's what i have also felt many times that these clots because you normally end up getting a bit late you don't uh, you're not doing it and there's huge clots actually inside right and that's why they keep on draining for quite some time because they're dissolving slowly what i generally do is i use the thr scoop that is long scoop we take a small incision yeah. maybe very helpful yeah yes we can just debride whatever wall has that has slow wall has formed nice presentation dr elens the overall uh, opinion of plastic surgeon is <coughs> they say whatever black skin you see mercilessly go down and take out everything excise it yes don't make multiple nicks and wait for that to still decay so in two cases literally nearly one palm breadth of skin straight away he cut it open till the bleeding edges and to our surprise within 7 to 8 days that area was ready for grafting instead of be making and putting suctions drain and waiting for skin to still you know demarcate they straight away go and excise everything 
No, no, Dr. Kale, I agree. If there is a uh, sort of damage to the uh, overlying skin, actually, when the patient arrives at your place, if the overlying skin is okay, I mean, you can uh, just decompress it. I mean, debride and decompress. Because these patients, uh, as you said, excising the whole thing would, would leave a big defect, actually, initially. What do you think, uh, Pradeep or uh, Rakesh, what do you think? I uh, agree. I think many of the skin I think, is normal on top. It's just the inside which is a damage. Yes. Uh, sometimes what you're seeing... The, if, once the skin has taken off... Yeah, if you get the patient early... Yeah. All this vasculature that is coming from inside is gone. So that is acting just like a biological cover. Otherwise, sure. it's going to go. No, that is, that is for... Uh, if you get, get them early, I have found them that if you do some kind of... Uh, uh, internal debridement and take out the uh, this thing, you know, the whatever material comes out, it helps a lot of time. The skin damage also is restricted. I mean, if, you, if it is delayed, then the problem is what you said, it's if the skin starts getting necrosed. Of course, the initial trauma is also significant enough to cause uh, skin necrosis as away as told. Because recently we had a case of a uh, compound pelvis. They had to do a primary colostomy. You could palpate through his rectal tear, his... Uh, Symphysis and he had a large moral level lesion on the buttocks. So what we did was we took uh, we drained the whole uh, what you call hematoma there, but we could put a suction right from GT up to the mid thigh. Then after third day when the plastic surgery, he said this skin is not going to survive. Don't wait for that. We still waited for five six days. Finally it was just hanging like a flap. He excised the whole skin after nine days. They did a grafting, and he has started walking now. So can I can I can I chip in with uh, two comments, please? Mm. Yeah, please. Yes, yes. Sir. So, so there are two very distinct situations. One that, as Doctor CP mentioned, if you have a patient with a moral level who's very mm -hmm. sick and you can't do too much more, in those conditions, you will have to do some kind of a minimal access till such time the patient is uh, stable enough for you to take him to theater and do a radical debridement if you need to intervene. So that in that case, all these uh, suction drains doing the uh, arthroscopic shaver techniques uh, do work and they might work. But the basic thought process is that if you have a significant enough collection for uh, or a significant enough moral level lesion, then just doing sitting on it and doing percutaneous drainage of any kind of debris will not uh, heal the lesion. Healing in these percutaneous or minimally invasive approaches will happen only if the amount of collection is less than 50 ml and not very significant where you can try either a compression dressing or a limited percutaneous drainage. But if the drain collection is significant, then you cannot allow the skin overlying the lesion to go bad because then you are tinkering with, uh, uh, tinkering with the soft tissue reconstruction that we can do for the lesion. And obviously, we all understand if somebody has a moral level lesion, it is going to change the way we are going to internally fix the bony injury. And if that is a, a pelvis or a stablum, so be it. So, Srinivas, you showed a very nice case of um, um, the uh, sharp femur fracture with uh, the uh, pelvis stable. fracture also, or the stablum fractures. So, uh, what does the faculty feel about this, these fractures? Should we fix the femur first or the establum first or pelvis first? Because unless you fix the femur, you don't yeah. get the ability to maneuver for the pelvis. Abhay, we can't hear you. We can't hear anything. Have I try again? Try again. We lost you. Yeah. So uh, a distal femur, a, a distal femur nail is a very good technique, and the femurs usually need to be fixed and stabilized first because it will allow the positioning of the limb. It will allow a proper surgical exposure of the pelvis and acetabulum, and it will not hamper a, a very accurate uh, acetabular fixation surgery uh, uh, because of a dangling uh, lower limb. So uh, just finished a literature review because these are all floating hips where you have an acetabulum or a femur with a uh, vestabulum or pelvis with a femur. 
and the goal uh, the key here is to fix the femur first and then deal with the pelvis or acetabulum or do them at the same sitting you do a minimal stabilization with an x fix do your uh, pelvis acetabular fixation and then come back and uh, and do your uh, femur fixation so if that is to be done we can do that but if one is staging it then probably femur has to be done first one more point to add it won't come in your way of gt osteotomy like in the case which is shown here yeah. uh, i think we have to fix the femur first then second fixation will be in the pelvis because you have to make the uh, pelvis stable on we or top of which where you can fix the stable in the better way first femur then unstable pelvis make it stable and then stable okay i think pradeep how much time do we have so we we are done done <laughs> okay bad So I think we we'll let uh, Pranav wind it up. Is Pranav around? Yeah, yeah. Pranav is around. So it uh, it was a great session. Two hours of hardcore academics about acetabulum and pelvis. Uh, representative cases about uh, you know all with good messages. Uh, I hope that people who watch it are uh, more interested and they would want to have more and more exposure and experience related to pelvic acetabular injuries. i would take this opportunity to invite them all to kolkata for our annual conference coming up in next month that is 22 23 and 24 of april for all people who are interested to attend it i request them to attend the uh, to go to the website aopascon aopascon.com and uh, look at the conference details and the registration details i take this opportunity also to thank our chair persons for the session today dr pradeep kothadia dr samir agrawal dr tony dr ashok gavaskar dr uh, das sir and uh, dr kale sir dr papanchari and our president dr rajput thank you very much all of you for sparing your valuable time and i think uh, it's time for us to all say goodbye jai hind and let us meet again in kolkata thank you Thank you. Man.